This episode is brought to you by PopCultureZone.com. For all your cleaning and pressing needs and as low as $5.99 a book, be sure to check them out. With over 8,000 books cleaned and pressed, PopCultureZone.com. What's going on, guys? And welcome back to Simple Man's Comics. This is Jack and Brian. And we're going to give you another top 10 back issues to be on the lookout for. This is one where we give you 10 issues each week that help to make up that master list for those back issues to be hunting for, right? Absolutely. And we've got a lot of great books this week. I loved last week's list. But this is another week, Brian, where we've got some books that are affordable keys, but books that really have some potential to move and move quickly. Yeah, this is a great list. You said it's very affordable. That's what I like about some of these books. I'm going to start right now with number 10. Coming out at number 10, this isn't just one single issue, but a group of issues that make up a great story arc. And we're talking about that death of the family. Yeah, we're looking at the new 52 here, and this is an iconic storyline. Um, now, this is a very big crossover set, one that spawns beyond just the Batman title and into all members of the Bat family, including like the Teen Titans. Yep, um, they all had those iconic covers. Yeah, those, they, they, there was two versions. There was kind of like that grotesque Joker um, cover as well as a, uh, a newsstand version, which tended to have the hero on the cover with the eyes cut out that you could actually, it was kind of like a pop-up cover. Um, all of those, co those newsstand covers are extremely tough. A lot of these covers, that's what this is really about. Um, there were some great covers throughout this run, uh, some, some iconic Joker covers, as well as some hard-to-find late prints, some great 1 in 25 incentives. Um, and this really gave us a look at one of the three Jokers. And this is why I think that this series is going to continue to become more and more important as we get ready for Jeff John's epic three Joker storyline coming very soon. It, this gives us a real depiction of one of those Jokers. And I feel like if you were trying to get to know this Joker, this is the storyline to pay attention to. This is one of my favorite trade paperbacks. I have the hardcover of this uh, that crosses over all the stories. It and had a collector's edition too, right? They had like a Joker mask. Yep, it had a Joker mask. And, and, and actually, that's actually how I ended up getting it. I got the Joker mask. Uh, my, my kid played with that and I took the book. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a, this is a great, a great read, but it's also a great set to collect. And one that I think people need to pay attention to, um, some of those Batgirl issues, uh, some, some of the Catwoman issues, um, they're not huge print runs. They're not easy to find, especially those late prints. Then coming on the list at number nine this week, we get Wolverine Origins number 10. Now, there's a lot of news this week at some of those various movie rumor sites, um, and it's, it's kind of been debunked, and a lot of people have um, spoke out against it, saying that it was kind of, hey, websites trying to take advantage of Pride Month, but uh, there were a lot of reports that Wolverine may be gay in the upcoming MCU. Um, but here's the thing. I think a lot of times, and we heard this, if you watched our podcast with Tim Vo and um, Manimal from uh, the Lords of the Longbox channel, Tim talked about how a lot of times when these scoop guys give these scoops, it comes from just little nuggets of information that they know about casting. So if they were looking for, say, you know, a homosexual character with animantium, people could then jump the gun and think, well, that's Wolverine. They're making Wolverine great. But, you know, this is where people don't know their comics because we're talking about Wolverine Origins 10, which is the first appearance of Wolverine's son, Dakin, who is, of course, a homosexual and was kind of a big character at one point in the mid 2000s and has kind of long been forgotten with all the hype surrounding laura kenny and x23 and it's really, really a character that i think is still sitting there prime for a, a great role especially opposite wolverine because i think the idea of like the abandoned son who's you know a homosexual could be something that could really resonate with a lot of families out there and being able to tell that story within our superhero universe, I think is pretty cool. So I would love to see Dakin show up in the future of the MCU. And to me, this is one of those first appearances where it's, it's, it's too affordable not to grab it and hedge your bet at this point. Um, certainly that variant, that claw variant is, is 
ungodly expensive, but that regular cover is something to pay attention to. And another thing to think about is number 10 is sometimes called a cameo. It's, it's really respected as the first appearance, but it is sometimes called a cameo. So if you want to hedge your bet by grabbing 11 as well, that's probably not a bad idea. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that it's with the sun. It seems like every three or four years or so, you get a spike in these books, and then it kind of calms back down again. But if, yep. right now, it's definitely in that downward cycle because a lot of people are more about the X23. But you pick those up, and like you said, if it comes up in the MCU, it's definitely worth adding to your collection. Next one on the list this week, we're going back over to the indie circuit with Vault Comics, and we're going back with the great writer, friend of the channel, David Boer. We're talking about Alien Bounty Hunter number one, which a lot of people may or may not be aware of. This has had Mark Wahlberg's involvement all the way since the beginning of this book. It's one of like the worst kept secrets, right? There was immediate news that Mark Wahlberg, upon reading the book, wanted to be involved in this project. And although he's been busy, has essentially held this project in hold for himself. He wants to do this. He believes this is a big role and he thinks he can kill this role. So because of that, I feel like this is like one of the most underinvested in books in all of comics because Mark Wahlberg is a big star, um, certainly has the ability to draw box office numbers. If you've ever read this book, it kind of lends itself to him where it's, it's, you know, it's action, but it's also comedy. And I think he'll play this role very well. And you mentioned David Boer. This is one of two books that we're going to talk about this week from the mind of David Boer, who I really think... Aside from a friend of the channel, aside from a good guy and a guy I really have grown to like, he's also a guy who I think has his kind of like finger on the pulse of what people in pop culture want to see right now. He tells really fun and unique stories, and I think he's a rising star in the world of comics writing. Yeah, definitely is one of the titles that I've been high on since... Day one. It was, kind of what, it was what introduced me to Vault pretty much, especially from Patreon member Regime Seabrook, who, who's like, hey, you got to pay attention to these guys. Have you heard of Vault? And then he said, hey, pick up this book. Hitting us at the number seven spot this week, we get all new Wolverine number one. All right, so again, we're talking Wolverine, and again, we're talking Wolverine's children. Now, this isn't the first appearance of X-23, but this, to me, falls into a lot of categories. It is the first appearance of her as Wolverine which I think we for sure could see in the MCU at some point. If they cast Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, I'm immediately, immediately pivoting to investing in this character. Because if they cast Hugh Jackman, he can't play Wolverine forever. He's in his 50s. Um, I think sometimes people hope for things that aren't realistic. If you're going to have this character kick around for 20 years, Hugh Jackman's not going to be the guy to do that. So if they cast Hugh Jackman, my belief is he'll play Wolverine for a period of time, and then they will transition to either a Dakin or a X-23 to play Wolverine. Certainly a female Wolverine would be marketable. We saw what this series did. This was a hot book. I feel like issue number one is undervalued, especially when you compare it to issue number two, the first appearance of Honey Badger, which has kind of been like the sweetheart book of the series. Um, but this is written by Tom Taylor, who's also a major, major, major rising star in comics, D big DC Comics writer, has Seven Secrets, a big indie book coming from Boom Studios. So he's somebody to keep an eye out for. He's the current writer of Suicide Squad. And, you know, this is something that I don't think people realize that he wrote. Um, but I, I'm bullish on Wolverine in general. We're going to get him in the MCU. And it, now's the kind of the time to get some of these auxiliary pieces. But also this follows the trend, Brian, of first appearance, way out of people's price range. I think they're going to look for that next best thing. And I think this may be it. Yeah. I remember when this book was getting hot and then it's kind of come down again, but at that same time, people are also picking up that Marvel point one variant that had her on the, her cover, in the yeah. costume on the cover. Yep. Which is, I mean, it, it's a valid book, it's, but again, cover appearance, I don't think counts as a first appearance, but that's always one of those things that's going to be debated comics, politics, either way, hedge your bet. If you can find that one, grab it. I grab it in $5 boxes all the time. It's a great yeah. grab for five buck book all day. Gonna go Pokemon style. You need to get that one. Yeah. Then get midway through the list at number six this week. We're talking about Marvel books that have those Wolverine ads in them. We're talking about Marvel premiere number 19, Daredevil number 115, and Thor number 229. That's right. When we talk MP19, we're talking the real MP, Marvel premiere, not Marvel previews. That's not MP19. We're talking Marvel premiere. So that book is the first appearance of Colleen Wing, already a book that's in demand. Colleen Wing obviously was a popular character on the Netflix uh, uh, Iron Fist series, as well as kind of the crossover um, within the Defenders, and definitely a character to be on the lookout for in the future going forward with Shang-Chi and some of the stuff that they have the 
potential to do in that area of the universe. But that's not all we're talking about. You mentioned those Wolverine ads. Now look, we mentioned Marvel premieres. These ad books, they have a unique place in the hobby. They're important. They are unique, cool collectibles. But in no way, shape, or form do I think anybody should be paying anything considering close to what a Hulk 180 or Hulk 181 goes for for any of these ad books. But we get new collectors in the hobby every day who may not realize that there is a Wolverine advertisement predating Hulk 181, um, not predating Hulk 180, but predating Hulk 181 in all three of these books, um, especially a book like Daredevil 115, which is kind of like a lesser printed book, um, kind of tougher to find than, say, the Thor book. Um, these are books that I think over time will, will matriculate in value. I think they will, they will gain value. People will become aware of them. People will want to add them to their collections as there, there's really no sign of Hulk 180 and 181 slowing down. I mean, these books are going to hit the stratosphere in pricing and people are always going to kind of, as you like to put it, have that Pokemon style of collecting where they're going to want to get them all. So I do think that these books are books that have a chance to rise in value. If you can find them cheap, if you can find a dealer not marketing them based upon the advertisement, simply marketing them based upon the book that they are. I grab Daredevil 115. I grab the Thor issue every time. Marvel Premier 19 is a little tougher because of Colleen Wing, but if you can get it cheap, it's one to grab because you've also got the backup of a great first appearance. Yeah, I agree. I look at it as kind of a cool collectible type thing, very, very niche, um, especially with those ads being in there. Um, I, there's not that fervor in me to like pick those up thinking, hey, these are the first appearance of Wolverine. But it's one of those, it's just a cool, like you mentioned, a cool thing in the hobby yeah. to have that. If you are a big fan of Wolverine or a new collector, like you said, you may not be aware that these have those ads in it, but in, like no way is that definitely the first appearance. Hitting us at number five, we're getting back over to that Bat family. It's probably one of the most epic story arcs that you're going to read. And we're talking about Dark Knight Returns number one. Yeah, really, we could talk about this whole series, but number one has that iconic cover, and it's the first appearance of this um, Frank Miller Dark Knight universe, which we've seen it play out a few different ways. We've seen the, the Dark Knights 2, Dark Knights 3, The Master Race, as well as Dark Knights of Golden Child, but we've also seen an entire film franchise from Christopher Nolan that essentially pulled directly from this Dark Knight story. And I got to tell you, you know, I think that that kind of thing is what makes this series so iconic. Um, it, it, it got hot during the time of those movies, and, if, and especially around the time when there was some talk about some stuff in like Batman versus Superman that really played into the series. But, you know, it's one of those things where this fits into that classic is classic. I think people are always going to be in demand for this. Uh, this is always going to be a Frank Miller classic. You can feel how you want about the art style. Um, maybe it's not Frank Miller's best art, but it's either, not his worst either though. <laughs> no, but either way, this to me is going to be one of those. It, it's up there with books like the killing joke. Um, and, uh, you know, other classics of the sort where you got to own this, you just got to, it's got to be in your PC. Um, if you're a, a Batman fan, if you're a DC comics fan, if you're just a fan of comics history in general, um, this is a key. And this is one of those ones where you're not going to see returns in the short term. Um, this is a blue chip. You're, you'll gain a small percentage each year as the years go by. But this is also one to be careful because the late printings look exactly like the first print. So make sure you are checking on that. Yeah, you see classic. This classic is definitely one you see fridge magnets or if, if they were still around, you'd probably see trapper keepers. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, the, definitely. There's posters, stored folios. This, this <laughs> image is everywhere. <laughs> And coming at number four this week, this is a definitely a favorite book of this channel. And we're talking about IDW's Canto number one. We talked about David Boer earlier, but he's also the writer of this book as well. Yeah, you know, I, I know that some people are going to say that you guys are big Canto fans, and we are, but I don't care. This series took the world by storm. We saw something in this series. Um, this isn't a, like, pump situation. We saw something that everyone else ended up seeing that this is a story that connects with all ages, that it tells on two levels to both children and adults. This is the type of universal storytelling that ends up making movies what they are. Um, this is Disney type shit. That's the way it feels to me. Um, and because of that, 
Uh, we've been bullish about this series since before it ever even came out. And the fact that it, it, it came out had this level of success that it had and then Spawn, they one shot, and then a volume two. And the volume two is seeing the demand that it's seeing, with, especially with the incredible variant cover reveals that we had this week. But I, I don't think Kanto is going anywhere. We've talked about merchandising. Um, we've talked about seven seasons in a movie. A shout out to David Boer and Drew Zucker. Um, and they're kind of their wanting to one-up community. But, um, you know, that's, it's, I, I really truly believe that especially with this team and how dedicated to taking this character as far as they physically can. And I do think we're going to come to a day where we're going to see Kanto merchandise in stores. I do think we're going to come to a day where there it will be a, a Kanto, whether it's animated feature um, or something like real digital um, similar to like a Pixar movie. I, I just think we're going to see that at some point. And, and I wholeheartedly believe that. And I think that as much as issue number one, the value has been affected by the difficulty with the print run and the condition of the print run as most books coming off the press had pretty severe damaging to them. Um, I still think that there is room left in this book because we rarely in comics get an opportunity to get in on characters as universal as I believe this character is. And I know that a lot of you out there are on top of it, but if you haven't checked out Kanto, if you're like, I don't know, man, is he, is he onto something or is he sipping the Kool-Aid here? Check out the trade paperback. And that's one of the things that we advertise reading, not just for enjoyment. Reading is great. It's the lifeblood of comics, but it's also a great tool for your investing because you can read a book and then see how that is going to project. And then that helps you get a better idea of whether or not you believe in the property or not. I promise you, if you read this book, you're going to love it. Yeah. And we'd be remiss. We talked about how great Dave Boer's story is on this, but the words don't tell the story by themselves. There's gorgeous yeah. interior art on there as well by Drew Zucker. Yeah, Drew Zucker, a great artist, really draws the emotion out of the book. We are now down to the top three. And then hitting us at number three this week, we get Wolverine number 80. So this is one of my favorite of the true first appearances. Um, this is, to me, this is like Donny Cates before Donny Cates. Um, here we get a character in X-23, right? And she's created and she's the hottest thing in comics. And we know that she's part of the Weapon X program, right? X-23. Um, and suddenly, years and years later, it is found that this book, Wolverine 80, and I'm talking about years later, years after X-23 is in comics, it was discovered that here in Wolverine 80, and I want to say again, shout out to Topher who has done work for the channel, contributed for the channel, um, AKA the mass speculator. Um, he, he is, his, his work in finding these appearances is just astounding. Um, but there is at one panel where you see a test tube being held as part of the weapon X program. And it says right on it, X 23. And this was far before the creation of Laura Kenny and X 23. So yes, it's just a test tube. It isn't a person, but it is absolutely the origin of X-23. It is absolutely how she was created. And I, I, while, again, I'm not at all advocating that this appearance should trump NYX by any means, but this is a valuable appearance to me. I think that this tells part of the story, and it's just one of the coolest and most unique things in comics. So, no, I don't think Wolverine 80 should be some multi-hundred dollar book, but I have no issue when people pay 25, 30, 35, and possibly even more as this character gets bigger because I do think it's so important to the mythos. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I'm, I'm of the opposite because you know how I feel like baby spec, hologram spec. Definitely test tube, but I also see your point and why you think it's valuable to the story. So if people are collecting it and want it for that, by all means do it. My opinion is I set that one out and I move on to the next one. But you do make a good point. And this is one of my favorite books too, that we talk about cheap books to grab out of those discount bins that I find this book on a regular basis for $3 and under. So as long as you're not putting a major investment out in this, I just don't, I just don't think it's something that can hurt you. I agree with that. Then coming in at our number two spot, every now and then we do have books on this list that aren't really obtainable, but they do deserve to be on this list, especially given with what this country's going through right now and the latest death 
an icon in comics and Denny O'Neill, but we're talking about that Green Lantern number 76. Yeah, that's right. We're talking about the beginning of the crossover between Green Lantern and Green Arrow. This is when the, the series title changed from Green Lantern to Green Lantern and Green Arrow. And it's when Green Lantern really got grounded. Now, Brian and I have mentioned a lot of times that we are big Green Lantern fans, probably our favorite DC character. But I also must admit that I'm a huge Green Arrow fan. And when I got back into comics, the very first big two character that I delved into was Green Arrow. The two stories that I read was Kevin Smith's Quiver, as well as this original Denny O'Neill, uh, Neil Adams run on Green Lantern and Green Arrow. And I really connected with this Green Lantern, Green Arrow series because I feel like it, it brought up things in comics that had never been touched on before. Um, and it's so ahead of its time. From drug use to poverty to the differences in the way um, the races are handled, especially by the heroes. And of course, this has been making its rounds this week. One of the most iconic panels, always been a panel that really resonated and connected with me, has been discussed a lot, both because of Mr. O'Neill's unfortunate passing, as well as what's going on in the country. Um, and there's a, a part in the book where Green Arrow is essentially taking Green Lantern around the neighborhood. Um, and Green Lantern is obviously, he's not a street level hero, right? He's not Daredevil, he's not Green Arrow. And, um, you know, he introduces him to an older black gentleman who says, I've been reading about you, about what you did for the blue skins, uh, and about the planet someplace where you helped out the orange skins, and you've done considerable for the purple skins. Only their skins you never bothered with, the black skins. I want to know how come. Answer me that, Mr. Green Lantern. And the look on Green Lantern's face of dejection as he says, I can't. And he realizes that while he's done so much cosmically, he has kind of neglected what is going on at home. And this really kicked off this whole series where these two characters began to really deal with the problems that are going on right here in our country. And like I said, ahead of its time, groundbreaking, poignant for the time that we're in right now. I literally get chills reading that panel um, to you all I think it's always had that effect on me. I think now it has an even greater effect. And I, I, it's something that I think uh, is an issue that still needs to be dealt with in comics today. Because while we do have street-level superheroes, and we certainly have superheroes of color, um, there are still some of those issues of we're dealing with things cosmically. We're dealing with these Thanos-level threats, and we're not always dealing with what is going on in our country. And it, God, there's some times where you got to look around and say, man, I wish superheroes were real, Brian. Yeah, I mean, you say it's ahead of its time. I think it was also relevant during that time, but it's one yes. that resonates from that moment through on, and that's kind of why this 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 issue is so popular because it dealt with stuff within comics that comics hadn't dealt with at that time. I can't say like I read it when it came out because it's it yeah. a little bit before me, but either way, it's just something that everyone knows. This issue is known for that. You've seen everyone in comics talk about it. Kevin Smith has talked about this a bunch of times, but either way, it's not a cheap issue. It's one that I've been wanting to add to my collection for a few years. I think if I could find it cheap, I'd add it to my collection. But given the popularity and the attention that this issue is getting right now, I might have to sit and wait a little bit. But it will be in my PC at one point. Then it's at the top spot this week. We're sticking with DC, and we got a two for four. We're talking about that Superman, Lois, and Clark number one and Convergence Superman number two. These are two books that when they came out were straight up under the radar. I was loving going to different LCSs and picking these up for cover price, especially Convergence Superman 2. I did an interview with the artist of both of these books, Lee Weeks, for a website that we were previously working with. And, you know, I asked him, what's the first appearance? Because there's a lot of debate between these two issues, right? In Convergence, you see the birth, but that's a baby appearance. In Superman, Lois, and Clark, you get to see the child, Jonathan Kent, who is kind of grow up to be Superman, and it's kind of telling, or a Superboy, and it's kind of telling that story. I think eventually he will be Superman, but, you know, it, it, which one of these is the one to go to? Now, Brian, I know you don't love the baby appearances, but it's funny, because when I asked the artist, Lee Weeks, I said, which one's the first appearance? He looked at me and goes, didn't we show his birth? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, don't you first appear in the world when you're born? And I was like, yeah. So I love comics logic because it, it really backs up how I feel that the first time a character appears, that's the character. 
Um, now, if you want his first appearance as Superboy, that can be argued, and we can go into that in detail. But Jonathan Kent is a character I know we're both bullish on. We've talked about Damian Wayne. We've talked about the need for comics to scale up. You look at the popularity of Miles Morales as people are kind of ready for a new Spider-Man. And yes, some of that plays in with, um, you know, the racial elements of things. But beyond that, I really think that Damian Wayne, Jonathan Kent, these younger heroes, Laura Kenny X-23, uh, as well as Miles Morales, these are the characters that I want to sink the majority of my money into. Because I think they're the characters that have the best chance of playing out in the future into something. And I think if you look at the pricing on these two books right here, they can hit the high end of $20, but frequently found for far, far, far less. Um, both of these books I like. Both of these books I grab anytime I find them under $10. And I'm bullish on them long term. So these, this is deserving of the top spot and, and really one that I think people should be paying attention to going forward, especially with Brian Michael Bendis kind of running the publishing side at DC. Yeah, I remember uh, I, I picked up quite a few copies of Lois and Clark number one. I did pick up one or two of Convergence Superman back in, you know, a few years ago when people were kind of talking about this and, and I guess you could say early speculation on it. But either way, still great issues. And I think, like you said, the attention's kind of dropped off of them, especially with the new 52 books. So goodbyes and, and great additions because it's one of those ones you put in your long box and just let it sit because it's a yep. great read nonetheless. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Superman, Lois and Clark, that whole series, amazing read. Um, I'm not a Superman fan. And that got me into Superman and I kept reading Superman. But there it is, guys. There's our top 10 for this week. Remember that full list will also be over at supermanscomics.com where we'll have links for available copies on eBay. Again, those are affiliate links. So if you buy using those links, a little bit of money comes back to the channel, helps support the channel. But let us know in the comments, what did you think of the list this week? Like we said, this is a list that you can keep adding, create that giant master list. We have that ebook out there for the first hundred picks, right? Absolutely. Don't sleep on that. Dollar ninety-five, under two dollars. You're getting a hundred books to be on the lookout for. You're also getting Brian and my take on how we see the market things to avoid trends we see coming in the future, and all for the low price of a dollar ninety-five. Yeah, we've gotten great feedback on that. We've gotten people that enjoyed it. We've had some good criticism on stuff to add to the future volumes. But either way, thanks to everyone that's bought that so far. And with that being said, guys, this is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.